Hi, and welcome to episode one of Scale by Design. Today, we are joined with Jacob Garlic. Jacob, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, James. How's it going? It's going really well, and we're so pumped to have you here with us today. And before we jump into it, we got a lot of great topics to talk about. I was hoping you could just tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Sure. I'm the managing partner of a private equity firm called Abraham Trust. We also have a pretty heavy venture arm that does venture capital work into early stage businesses as well. We're 50-50 between the venture deals we do and full-on private, uh, private equity buyouts that we do. And uh, my background started in mergers and acquisitions, primarily doing due diligence on behalf of a multifamily office. I spent the first few years doing that and then I had an opportunity to join a small software startup called M Help Desk, the CRM for field service com companies, plumbers, electricians, landscapers, carpet cleaners, IT repair. And we replaced their clipboards with iPads. After we were lucky enough to sell that business, I went right back into M&A as an advisor and started investing my own money along with co-investors. Uh, and that led us to a track record that allowed us to open up a full blown private equity fund close ended. Nice. Nice. You, you've definitely been busy and it's, it's crazy. Yeah. To think that... <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's been, yeah. it's been quite the run and, uh, an absolute blast. And it, it's, it's, you, so you still have so much of your career ahead of you, which is what I find so imp impressive is that you've done all this at a, at a pretty young age as well, uh, and got into where you are at, at so, so early in your career. So it's, um, uh, I've really been impressed kind of following your journey and seeing what you've been up to over the past couple of years. Thank you, James. Yeah, it was a pretty wild ride at 23 at M Help Desk that really put us in a position to be where we are today, almost a decade later. For sure. And uh, I wanted to see, you know, one of the things we wanted to talk about today was just how you think about the future and how you think about creating, uh, crafting and understanding a vision for the future and how that kind of plays into creating great product companies. Could you tell us a little bit about your philosophy there? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great subject. Uh, in fact, as an investor, you play a different role than the CEO of a company who might be pretty heavily challenged by the day-to-day -day operations of a company. And so as someone who gets to spend their time spent most in strategy, <laughs> Being the investor, we spent a lot of time thinking about the future of the companies we invest in, as well as the uh, categories we want to invest in. And what we do then is agree on what future we like the most. And we start looking for businesses that are pursuing that future, leaders that are pursuing that future. And we're either going to invest in them or, or acquire them, depending on the stage that they're at and then give them the resources they need to grow. Something that's important to recognize for our firm is we typically do not retire leadership. In other words, if your goal is to sell your company and then exit that business personally, we're not a very good fit for you. We're typically providing uh, liquidity for the founders of the business or the executives who run the company or the shareholders, but also hoping to spend the next five to 10 years working with you to continue to grow the business. We're very much looking to partner with great leaders. And what we have found is finding an alignment on a particular outcome of the future is a phenomenal way to kick off uh, an investment strategy or partnership with the group because having an aligned vision of the future uh, keeps you on the same tune as you encounter challenges, hit new opportunities, decide how to allocate capital, who to hire, and it, it, it trickles down throughout the rest of the business. That lends itself quite well to the product roadmap, ultimately, right? The products you choose to create, the services you choose to roll out, all stem from the, the direction in the future you're trying to create for your customer. So what's a, as, as, a, as an investor, what's the best way to do that? Is it more so that you identify industries that you feel like have the most opportunity for, uh, I, I suppose, innovation, uh, which is a really buzzy word, but, you know, in terms of just looking for the best opportunities there, or is it, is it, how, how do you go about doing that with your firm? You know, it's, it, it's, a, it's probably the thing we spend the most time debating, right, is, is how to pick 
an investment strategy uh, across a number of categories. We are an industry agnostic investor. In other words, we do not have any specific uh, swim lane that we are beholden to, right? Whereby you have some venture funds that are a series A consumer focused technology investor. And then you might have a private equity firm that's looking to acquire large scale logistics businesses. We don't have those restraints. And as a result, that type of freedom comes with <clears throat> a tremendous responsibility of zeroing in on what we're going to invest in this year. As a result, picking uh, the future that we're after allows us to have a North Star, right? And so the North Star for us each year may adjust itself by way of we make a bet in a particular category last year. And now we have a platform for making subsequent investments in that space. And so we're now looking for a new North Star and a new emerging market that we might be interested in investing in. Love it. And, and I, you know, this is, this is all really great, very high level strategy, but I would, I would love to, to hear a little bit more about, could you give us real examples? I mean, at M help desk, for instance, right. Sure. A company that you grew and, and, and ultimately exited. I, I would love to hear a little bit about, could you, could you walk us through that process? Like, did, did you know that the, the vision from the very, the beginning when you, when you just had a prototype and just the founding team, did you already have that vision of the future intact? Or is that something that there were iterations of over the first year or two speaking with customers? I mean, how, tell us a little bit about that process. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great example to dive into, to get down the more tactical details. So M help desk uh, was founded prior to my involvement with the business. Uh, the guys who founded the business were two Lockheed Martin engineers and a former uh, home services executive had been at it for a number of years prior to my arrival. And so they had developed a really best in class solution initially just trying to tackle ticketing specifically for IT repair shops. And they were still using pen and paper, even though they're offering an IT service, they're managing their business with pen and paper and Excel spreadsheets. And what was interesting is it became clear that plumbers, electricians, carpet cleaners, HVAC, all had the same workflow as an IT repair company, even warranty work providers, whereby someone was going to be dispatched into the field to solve a problem. And so that became the first, what I would call act one North Star for M Help Desk was to replace that clipboard with an iPad and give them the ability to manage their business, start to finish, take a finger signature, take credit card payment, sync to QuickBooks, the whole nine, right? And they had 5,000 premium users when I joined the business, right? And the challenge that they were encountering was hundreds of businesses were signing up for free trials at the time every single month, and none of them were converting. And so act two of the business where my involvement came into play was creating the business's voice for the customer, right? And actually creating a customer service experience for those free trials, contact them demo the product, help them onboard once they've decided to purchase, give them a phone number to call. They had zero customer interaction prior to that point as a, as a mandatory part of the sales process and onboarding process. It was very reactive ticketing support. And so all of a sudden, 40% of people who were demoed purchased, right? And after we onboarded them, uh, we had a less than 10% churn on an annual basis. We had single digit churn by the end of it. By the time we sold the business, we were in the single digits uh, for annual attrition for someone who had been on our platform for more than 30 to 60 days. And that was a really big deal. If, real quick, I, in terms of adding in that more so that customer service layer and thinking about obviously optimizing the, the product toward what's what's really going to help the customer how much of that was more so just you kind of seeing the vision of like this just makes sense right people need they're going to need these things in order to, to do their job more effectively or was it was it more of like was there a, a customer feedback loop that enabled you to make the changes or did you just kind of independently decide 
okay, this is the direction the product needs to go? Yeah, so I'd come from a background of sales and marketing, specifically in portfolio support in the M&A work that I had been doing. And it had become extremely obvious that a customer feedback loop was going to be critical in making the decisions on what to use our developers' precious time and resources uh, to build. And, and so it wasn't very long before we had maybe nine out of 10 products that we were rolling out or features we were rolling out on our monthly or quarterly releases that were coming directly from our customers. In fact, they could suggest a new feature. And then if you were a paying customer, you could upvote up to five different product features. Um, and uh, that would make it to our dev team and our CTO. And that's what we would build. You got to listen to your customers. And we, we found that there were really two product roadmaps that were very critical and important to our success. One was the sales roadmap for product. And the other was the customer success roadmap for product. What do I mean by that? It's best illustrated uh, by my 75 uh, year old mother, or she's about to be 75, I should say. My mother, the past three cars that she's gotten demanded that it had GPS, okay? Demanded it. And of course you can't just buy a car with GPS. It, it's a whole additional like four or $5,000 package, you know, comes with the roof and a better sound system, whatever it is. She never uses it, right? It collects dust, all three, but you know, this time she's gonna buckle down and really use it. But here's the thing, the car dealer could not make that sale without offering a, a model with a GPS system in it. She would not buy it without, okay? My mother, by the same token, cannot physically drive a car unless it has parking sensors, okay? She has depth perception issues. As a result, she also cannot purchase or use the vehicle unless it has parking sensors. Both of those features were critical for that car dealership to make that sale to my mother. The same thing applied to us at M Help Desk. There were features that our sales team was encountering as objections over and over and over again. For example, does your technology have XYZ feature? Does it have the ability to do parts tracking, inventory management? These things were constantly coming up. And so we would build them out. And quite frequently, it would lead to us having a smoother sales process, but we found that our customers weren't really using these tools. Uh, for the same reason, when you hit January 1st, you decide you're gonna eat healthier and exercise more. They felt that they were finally gonna buckle down and get all their equipment under management and get barcodes in. That's a lot of work, but we built that feature because a good portion of them would eventually use it, but they definitely would not purchase unless they had the option to use it. Just like a gym, maybe needing a basketball court or a pool to get someone to sign up, they use it occasionally, but they really need the weights and the cardio. The product side for M Help Desk, our customers could not use our tool unless it had offline capability, right? The ability to work when they go into someone's basement or attic and lose connectivity. Um, and as a result, the tool needs to still be able to function, save data, update the work order, right? Take images and then sync once it comes back online, right? A plumber that's never had an iPad before to manage their business isn't going to say directly to you, I need offline capability, right? They're going to say, we trialed, you know, your competitor software and it doesn't work when I go to the basement. That's what they're going to say, right? And so having a business team that can translate those business requirements into technical requirements and build the business case study for both the, the GPS and the parking sensors and have a critical roadmap for both selling and for keeping customers was the secret sauce to our success. That's a, that's a really good analogy. I love yeah. that. And yeah, it's also, it one. just makes, it makes so much sense. Yeah. Well, so, so talk to us about the progression from there. So I, I'm just I'm really curious to know. So how long were you, did, were you at M help desk and, and can you tell us a little bit about leading up to the exit and what that looked like? 
Yeah, absolutely. So my, my partners had been full time on the business for a couple of years, uh, almost six years, roughly, uh, between their part time involvement and full time involvement before I showed up. So, you know, it, it, it took a number of years to be an overnight success, right? Uh, and they had a very mature technology before I joined. Um, and then I got in right when they had all this organic demand, but very little sales acumen. And that was my value add to the partnership. From the day I joined uh, to the day we sold it was just about a little over a year. And it was an absolute rocket ship of a ride. We onboarded thousands of customers every single month via our free trial, closed thousands of paid users every month as a result, and ended up being uh, sold to a uh, home advisor. They took a majority stake in the business. They were the number one lead gen provider in the space. They're an IAC owned uh, company. And so it was a really healthy partnership and fit uh, for the business. And I don't know that I'll ever experience something so massively intense as a pressure cooker in such a short period of time, because most businesses do take a number of years to get to that point and I just happened to join right at that inflection point for the business. It was an absolute rocket ship of a ride. That must have been pretty crazy. I, yeah. I'm just curious, like what, what kind of hours were you pulling? Was it, was it nonstop uh, or like what, what, what was I, it like? It, it, was, it was absolutely incredible. Um, it's the hardest I've ever worked. You know, I had that young 23 year old energy uh, easily sleeping in the office uh, regularly, uh, pulling 20 hour work days, at least four or five days a week and loving every single second of it. I was super right. hungry. Um, I loved the people I was working with. I had great partners in that business. Um, and you know, uh, when you build a culture that is all super tuned into the same focus of hustling we had no venture backing. We felt like a bootstrap ragtag team of brothers and sisters in the trenches going into the battlefield every single day. It was incredible. You know, we would, we would wake up, uh, I would be, you know, online by 7 a.m. And then we'd have an 8.30 sales meeting in the office. 9 a.m. we're on the phones serving customers all the way until uh, 5 p.m. Pacific, which we were in Virginia. So eight o'clock, then from eight to 10, doing the admin work, people would hang out and like after work and, you know, uh, have a good time. We were in AOL's incubator uh, at the time called Fishbowl Labs. They had, you know, pool and ping pong and um, some video games. And so the, the team would hang out after pulling a 12 hour shift, which was incredible. Uh, and then I'd stay up till, you know, maybe midnight, two in the morning, working through that day's reports and figuring out what adjustments we may wanna make. All admin work happened outside of business hours. Um, and then maybe we'd stay up because we had international customers as well come through and I'd take any demos that the team wasn't around for. Uh, and then we'd do it all again the next day. It was an absolute incredible assembly line of people giving their blood, sweat and tears. And that is what's required, uh, especially at that early stage, right? Mm -hmm. If we didn't make the sale, you know, someone's kid's tuition didn't get paid. And so that was serious pressure. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of, it's interesting how in those early days, right. Or when you're, when, even if it's not the early days of the company, when, when you're hitting that inflection point, as you put it, it's, it's still, I'm sure you look back fondly on it, even though you were pulling those, those crazy hours because oh you God. really golden years. Yeah. It's yeah. like, you're part of A something so year. special, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was absolutely magical. I still, even when we were in it, there was virtually no material point that I can recall where I was unhappy about the amount of time I was putting into it. Right. I mean, we were, we were just, we were, it was attraction rather than promotion. We were just magnetically charged to be there and work hard. And we were all after something together. It was intoxicating. Even if you walked into our office, after hours, you could smell it on the room, you know, and we, we felt it was important to shower our customers with enough love that made them feel like they were dealing with a fortune 500 business, right? You know, when I joined them help desk, they were 
three partners and one part-time customer service rep. That was it. And when we sold the business uh, about a year later, we were still only 33 people. So it was from our perspective, this massive scale up, but we were serving thousands of customers right. and we wanted them to feel like they could call 24 seven and get someone on the phone and be showered with love. I love that. I love that. Yeah. And so now you, you've done, you've done it both, right? You've, you've been an executive, you've scaled to a successful exit. Now you've been a successful VC and PE uh, partner and, and running your own firm. I, I would love to get your thoughts on when you're, when you're looking at companies to invest in, can we talk a little bit about what you look for on the founding team? Mm-hmm. Sure. I, sure. Wherever you want to start. I mean, I don't, I mean, I have a specific agenda there. I just more so like whatever you think is the most important or the things that you look for or want yeah. to identify. Ha happy to go macro and tactical. And I'll, and I'll start at the ground level on the, on the tactical side and sort of work my way up if you'd like. Um, yeah, let's do it. We, we have a score. We have an acronym that we use on our first interaction with another human being. We call it our Scott score. Okay. It's an acronym. So uh, S stands for smart. And uh, we meet it in every facet. You know, is what we're really looking for is some type of unique industry expertise or perspective around something, right? It's not so much IQ, but rather why does this person feel well positioned enough to go endeavor to start a business or grow their business or keep playing in the space. And so we're looking for someone who, when you talk to you, you're just undisputedly clear, unequivocally clear that you're dealing with an expert in a space. It is my experience that people who succeed really know their space really, really, really well. The second letter in that acronym is C, which stands for connect the dots, right? So if you really have this unbelievable insight into a space, can you then take that insight and um, sort of logically connect the dots in a format that other people can then understand your insight, right? Where the opportunity is, right? Just knowing is, is not enough, but being able to connect the dots to an opportunity or a direction to go uh, and, and make it clear for us. Uh, the O stands for obviousness. So uh, once they've connected those dots, does it instantly click? Is it clearly obvious that this is a no-brainer direction to take the business? In my experience, the businesses that struggle the most do not have a very obvious, clearly laid out plan um, that makes a boatload of sense. It, it's rarely complicated and difficult to understand and then succeed. If we look at the businesses that are sort of the darling technology companies of our generation, let's look at SpaceX, right? It is very clear that they are trying to go colonize Mars. Everything else they do is in an effort to get to that place, right? Tesla is trying to create sustainable transport in a world that doesn't rely so heavily uh, on traditional methods of power, right? So. For us, we're looking for that just no-brainer decision. M Help Desk, it was also very obvious, right? No more pen and paper, everything's digital, thus faster, no more double data entry. You have to remember, people were calling in, hi, my light bulb is out, can you send an electrician out? That someone was writing that data down, then they were going ahead and filling out a work order. Then the electrician would come into the office, pick up like 10 clipboards, <laughs> right? These work orders, and then go to the job, fill it out, give you a yellow, blue, red copy, come back, the admin would enter that into the payment system, get an invoice out, take payment, enter that it's paid, and then re-enter that data for like a fifth time into QuickBooks, right? It was obvious that that wasn't going to be the way they do it now that iPhones existed, right? So that was like very obvious, right? Um, the first, we have two T's. T first stands for traction. So we're, we're, we're traction investors. We do not invest in any business that is pre-revenue, although we will get quite close. And we do also spend a lot of time with early stage startups that, you know, executives thinking about starting a company and entrepreneurs that are maybe about to exit a business and start something new. But we do not, uh, as, uh, as a matter of principle or thesis, invest in those businesses. We think there's enough friends and family and sort of uh, 
seed capital to startup companies that is doing a great job. Our goal is to help scale. So we're looking for businesses that have a little bit of traction. M Help Desk would have been a great portfolio company for us. They have customers, they got stickiness, they have product market fit, and now they have a clear path to acquiring new customers and they know how to onboard them and keep them. And, and then we're gonna finance that growth. Clear unit level economics, okay? And then uh, finally, trust, right? It's in our name, Abraham Trust. But is this somebody that I can trust in with my family, in with the board, and with other partners in network LPs? Because if we're going to invest in your business, we're going to green light our whole network for you, right? And if I don't feel comfortable putting you in front of someone saying Abraham Trust invested in us and has that stamp of approval from us, uh, then it's going to be difficult for us to help be a value-add investor. We do not want to be a simple check writer. So we give a Scott score on the very first meeting, one to 10 on each of the letters in the acronym. And uh, we're looking for really good grades, right? We want eights, nines or better uh, on all of them. And sometimes there's room for improvement. Uh, and in my experience, it's very difficult to really get to know someone in one meeting, right? Uh, the best relationships I have are some of the longest relationships that I have. The most experience that I have with someone, the deepest I've gone with them. So for us, we spend a lot of time getting to know people, uh, which is unusual in venture, especially. Uh, private equity, it's a little easier. We might meet you a couple of years before you sell your business to us. Uh, but in venture, you might be raising around right now, right? And, and that's okay. We, we really believe in a relationship first approach. So that's yeah. the, that's the real tactical. That, that was great. There's just so much value in that. So thank you. I know everybody listening is, is going to love that. Um, so thanks for taking the time to just break that down. And so, and it sounds like a lot of entrepreneurs, it's, it's the obvious part. Like what you were talking about, like, is this, it's, it's like, are they really solving something that you, you, you know, is going to be a big winner? Um, do you see that more on the, is it, is it more on just like the product solving a problem that's really worth solving? Or is it also on the go-to-market side where they haven't really figured out how to position it or who their ideal customer is? Or I'm just kind of curious to, to is it more, more about product functionality or more about identifying the product market fit or, or uh, something more on the go-to-market side? Could you explain that to us? Yeah, this is why we <clears throat> spend so much time thinking about the future and the customer problem that we're looking to solve. So it's much more frequent that we would identify an area we want to invest in because we're very clear on a problem that exists and a future where that problem won't exist because it will have been solved. We think about how it might go about being solved. And then we go look for a business that fits that bill, right? So companies that we're typically passing on investing in aren't a perfect fit or close to a perfect fit for solving that particular problem. They may have a, different, a difference of opinion on how to get there. They may have a difference of opinion on how to go about solving that problem, um, specifically with their product. Um, but for us, we're looking for very clear unit level economics that uh, don't rely on some type of interesting loss leader to, to get to where they need to be going, right? You, you, you cannot knowingly sell dimes for nickels. There's no way to make up for that in volume. And so we, we typically are getting involved at a point where that part's been solved for. Gotcha. And, and you, uh, <laughs> curious, you know, we hear, uh, hear a lot of VCs talk about they're looking for firms that have multiple founders Mm -hmm. you know, they want, they want, they feel like just from a, a level of accountability and then also just, just from a workload perspective, it just, it makes their companies are a lot more likely to succeed with multiple founders. And your from your perspective, is that, is that true? Do you, do you look for, okay, a go-to-market founder and a, a product or an engineering <laughs> founder, or, or is it all over the place? Some of them is, is, you know, companies are just one founders, others have teams of three or four. I mean, curious to get your thoughts there. Yeah, it's interesting. Our portfolio is made up of solo founders and leaders and other portfolio companies have 
uh, two, three, four co-founder partners that are, you know, either all still with the business or some were critical to starting it and some left after that to pursue other businesses. Um, I will share from experience um, that my, my opinion on this is that one or the other is not necessarily more critical to someone's ability to succeed. In other words, I don't believe you will fail or succeed because you are either solo or with a partner. I will share it as much easier to share in the constant nose grinding, bone grinding challenges that occur to build a business um, when you have someone shoulder to shoulder with you in the trenches. You know, I got to build them, helped us with incredible partners, right? The real founders of the business, right? I was not a founder of that business. And having them by my side to go through it together made a world of a difference. After we sold them help desk, I took 12 months uh, to develop a concept and even raised a couple million dollars for what I thought would be my next software company. In my background, it's easy to just give this sort of polished story of how I got to where I got. But there was a stint there before I jumped directly back into M&A and got back into private equity where I thought I was going to start another software company. And I did that on my own uh, for the beginning. And it was absolutely brutal. And then I brought in a partner who was an absolute godsend, uh, a guy by the name of Rick. And Rick was there every day in the trenches with me and uh, had skill sets that I didn't have that were a nice balance for my, for my areas of weakness, right? You have blinders on when you're building a company. You're really focused on getting to the finish line. And so that creates exposure and risk. And Rick and I, we failed together. And even that part of the process was a little less painful. Uh, we burned through all of our investors' money uh, all the way down to the point where we had to lay off the people that we had hired to help us with the business, the single most stressful day of my career up until that point, because letting someone go at a successful business, typically you've set expectations. You both know that they're not meeting those expectations and that they may be better off finding a position somewhere else. And they know what's expected of them. And no one's surprised if you do a good job, no one's to be surprised if you're going to let them go. When your business fails, you're letting go of someone who has given you all their blood, sweat, and tears, put all their heart and soul into it, done exactly what you asked for, and you failed to deliver what they needed to be successful. And as a result of your failure to hold up your end of the bargain and deliver a great product that is competitive and customers love that they're being let go, that's brutal. And I have to say, I don't know if I could have failed without Rick, it, it may have crushed me. So from that perspective, I highly encourage, if not, you know, sometimes co-founders aren't around, right? And you're not gonna delay starting your business just because you can't find a co-founder. But I highly encourage all of our executives to find true partners that they can go do this together. And that's the same way I feel about my fiance in life, right? I'm getting married to a beautiful woman named Kristen. And uh, I don't know that I could be on my game the way I am without her love and support and vice versa. You know, it's a little different. Yeah, it makes makes a lot of sense. And I one one follow up question I have on on the the co founder conversation is is there a certain criteria criteria that you you would recommend founders to go through when they're selecting a, a co founder? Is there sort of like an interview process or, or or top things that you look for in a co founder to really? Because I think one of the challenges I I had in the early days when I founded Secure Vision would just be overcoming the trust barrier of, okay, am I really sure. going to go into business with somebody, somebody else, uh, 50, 50. And do I, I mean, it just seems like that would be, it would be so, I mean, obviously people do it successfully. Right. But I'm assuming sure. for every successful partnership, there's probably 10 that, <laughs> that don't work. I mean, it just, I can only right. imagine, maybe not that, or maybe more. that's a little cynical, but I no, it might, it, it, it's probably more because most businesses fail to even get to early stage traction. 
Right. So, so how do you go about picking a co-founder knowing if somebody's, is this the person that I want in the trenches with me? Is it, is it just gut instincts and, and okay, do they kind of compliment you in terms of have, have skill sets that, that you don't have, or is there something else that I'm missing here? Well, um, my approach to picking a partner is much the same as how I picked my life partner. Right. And, uh, not so much the criteria, uh, but the, the process and the stages that I've gone through have served me well and our portfolio well, I think, which is you cannot rush it past its natural time frame uh, for progression, right? What's your whole goal of a first date? Is to get to a second date. You know, that's really it. You can't tell someone everything about yourself on day one. You certainly shouldn't be proposing to them on the first day, right? Um, and so as a result, you, you have to give an opportunity or a sp hold a space that gives you the opportunity to develop a relationship because that's the foundation through which trust in my experience is built. And so it, it is very rare uh, that you'll find two co-founders that met each other the day before they decided to start a company, right? It happens, but most people have some type of history together. Um, or someone was recruited along the way, right? And it was a hired position and sort of developed a relationship and partnership over time. And so that, that has been my observation. And, and certainly there are more than one path that you could take uh, to find a co-founder or a partner. Uh, but in my experience, um, it, it absolutely cannot be a process that is fast-tracked. It has to develop naturally. Right. And I think now that you said that, I think the majority of successful companies that I work with and have worked with throughout the years, the co-founders usually worked together at a previous startup and not necessarily, they, may, they maybe weren't the co-founders, yeah. but they worked in that ecosystem. They, you know, they work in tech, they knew each other for several years. And then, you know, or sometimes it's like one of them was a co-founder. One of them was one of the initial employees and they co-found on the second thing. Right. Right. Um, so, so I see you're right. I think, I think generally speaking, that probably has the highest success rate when it's, it's, you know, somebody that trust is established. And, and then also you, you probably have worked with them in a similar environment, right? I yeah. see, I would say that Continuity. most of our customers, yeah, exactly. That's, that's typically what I see now that I think about it. Continuity has been demonstrated over and over again as a winning uh, success factor. Right. And I think that was really well demonstrated with uh, the dream team uh, that Michael Jordan was on, whereby their coach was really smart um, for their first couple of practices. He, you know, he had a bunch of all-stars, just like Mega, Magic Johnson, Charles Barkley, right? Michael Jordan, all on the same team. That's insane. And so something he did is he brought them into a practice scrimmage with a college team. And he kept them trading in and out and the college team mopped the floor with them, just absolutely demolished them. And how could you have all these NBA legends get demolished by a college team? Well, that college team had plays worked out. They had played together for a couple of years. They knew everybody's position and strengths and weaknesses. They knew what their game plan was going in. You know, Michael, was taking the ball up and then he was passing it to Johnson. No one wanted to be a ball hog and they didn't have any plays worked out. And the coach was making it increasingly difficult by changing them out, rotating, subbing them in and out. Okay. I will take continuity over uh, and, and, and a successful track record of execution over a great concept or uh, a group of hired guns any day of the week right? Continuity and execution is so much more important. There it is. I love that. Nick, we got to get that into its own little video clip because that was, that was great. Um, for those listening, Nick's our VP of marketing and, and producing the show behind the scenes, but, um, yeah, yeah that was a great, that was a great answer. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Nick. Uh, that was, that was so helpful. Uh, well, we're coming up on time. We got a few minutes left. I, I want to ask you, um, could you just talk to us a little bit about the, the metrics? And a lot of this is pretty straightforward stuff that everybody looks at, but nonetheless, like it would just be great to just do a kind of a run through of this is, you know, this is, I don't know if it's like 
growth metrics, you're looking at top line ARR, uh, the growth of that ARR, uh, gross margin. What, what are you looking mm-hmm. for? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, net revenue retention. These, type, I mean, what are the, the the core things that when you're looking at a product SaaS company that you're looking for from a, a metrics and a financial perspective? Yeah, I think I think you would find our approach to tracking the success and performance of our portfolio companies, both on the venture side and the private equity side, in portfolio and their competitors, candidly, uh, it, it's quite straightforward and boring uh, by most standards. We are not looking for a creative KPI or metric or OKR that defines our uh, investment success that wouldn't be out of line with um, traditional business finance. What do I mean by that? Um, you can get yourself into trouble if you only focus on customer ads or uh, top line revenue growth or your uh, ability to retain customers even, if that's the only metric that you focus on as a defining factor, right? Um, you know, on the consumer app space that could be viewed as, you know, daily active or monthly active users, right? We see this all the time in the cons- in consumer products or food and beverage when you sell through the retail, right? Number of SKUs sold per store per week, right? That velocity, that data story helps you land new accounts. Any one of these can be important for the business, but if any one of them is singled out as the only metric to define success, you can get into big, big trouble, right? And so for us, we are uh, obsessing over unit level economics, right? Show me how you can make profit on a single can of water, right? On a single seat sold of your software and explain to me the customer acquisition cost against your 12 month payback period and your lifetime value, right? And if, and if you can't really clearly illustrate that, we are gonna spend a lot of time working on that and getting to that clarity because, you know, revenue is sort of vanity, right? And profit is sanity, but cash flow is king, right? <laughs> and it, it's kind of funny um, you know, venture back businesses, especially put a, put a high value on some of these vanity metrics because other, they've seen other companies successfully demonstrated an ability to fundraise off of them. And they're in for a rude awakening when it comes time uh, to successfully exit the business, build, grow the business or raise another round of funding. Well, I think, I think that, um, Right. I mean, it seems like in Q4, particularly, we were seeing a lot of that, just these insane valuations that are just surely based on ARR, sure. um, not even necessarily significant ARR growth. Right. It was like, from what, from my connections, there was, I was hearing about a lot of companies that were maybe around like 1.5 to 3 million in ARR that were getting anywhere from 60 to 100x revenue valuations yeah just yeah. based on on that and a lot of those same companies are now unfortunately kind of correcting course it seems and yeah. you know we're seeing kind of like this tech bubble and and we're starting to see i think what is it like 17,000 jobs in tech startups um uh you know uh, in terms of layoffs uh, right right now and that number seems to be i mean i think coinbase oh. just announced earlier today another 18% mm-hmm. of their staff is going to be let go. So we're starting to see a correction across startups, growth stage, crypto. Almost across the board, almost. Right. So so curious to get your thoughts on what's happening in the market. I mean, I, you know, as an insider in the VC community, what what's going on in tech right now and how deep do you think this is going to cut? Yeah, absolutely. Um, every six months, we produce an economic outlook over the next half decade specifically. And... We think uh, the next half decade, the market's flat or down categorically by any metric. And uh, that should change your thinking around your, your spending habits, your investing habits, and the product decisions you're making, right? Avoiding cash consumption heavy uh, product decisions 
uh, for the business. Finding a way to be a better steward with your capital, tighten the belt and bootstrap. We believe it'll be more difficult to raise capital over the next 12 to 18 months as a result and potentially further than that. It's very difficult to predict the future, um, uh, but it is worth it to spend time forming an opinion on what you think will happen and then make decisions around that, right? G generally up, flat, or down. And going into what we believe is gonna be a flat or down uh, economy, uh, businesses are going to have to focus on finding customers, serving customers in ways that are uncorrelated to market sentiment, right? And, and so will we as an investor, right? There are certain categories that we can be investing in over the next half decade that don't have a correlation to whether the market's up or down. And we'd also like to avoid inversely correlated businesses. And that's just our preference. Other businesses find a way to make money that way, but um, we don't want a business that only does well in a down market, but rather is less relying on up or down and more trending towards the future. Let me give you an example. The price of deodorant may be up or flat or down five years from now. I don't know. What I do know is that more people will buy their deodorant on subscription digitally and have it delivered to their front door five years from now than do today, period, full stop. That's a fact, right? That's a future I believe in and see. More people will buy their utility groceries, uh, items, consumer products on subscription online five years from now than do today. So that means there's gonna be a whole mess of businesses that benefit from that fact. And the increase in volume will translate to more revenue for them, irrespective of whether or not the price of that good or service is up or down. And that's what I mean by completely uncorrelated to the market. What it's correlating to is where consumer behavior and purchasing habits are going, right? So that's a place, for example, that we're looking at finding businesses to invest in and acquire is the businesses that support that fact, for example, in e-commerce fulfillment, pick, pack, and ship, or 3PL um, in the softwares that back them right? Logistics, especially, right? Uh, for example, uh, if you want next day delivery, right now, pretty much your only option is uh, Amazon as a vendor, right? Or a merchant, right? If you want to provide that to your customers. Now there are a slew of startups tackling that problem and offering that solution. Hey, how would you like to not sell on Amazon, sell on your Shopify store and offer next day delivery? right? That, bet, that business will benefit from the mere fact that customers want that and may not be buying everything off of Amazon, right? It makes That's a lot an, of sense. An example. And, and I guess my, my last question just correlated to, to market conditions as well. And it, it's, I, I find your strategy very interesting and it seems obvious to me that that's the way to go talking about this is that, you know, is it clear and, and how much right. does it make sense? I mean, I think it's a good strategy. We, we, we try and live by a high Scott score, you know? Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, me and my partners, which again, so lucky to have, I didn't form this opinion on my own. Talk about co-founders. Mm -hmm. I have partners in our firm that we collectively, uh, you know, we are more valuable as a unit than we are as individual parts. And I'm blessed to have the most incredible partners in the business to help me form these opinions. And speak for sure. Them. For sure. What we saw in 2020, last question, we are we very, just a minute or two left. Um, sure. We saw tech got hit really hard when the pandemic started. I mean, every, everyone did, but I mean, just speaking at secure vision, right? Like we saw, a significant drop within a two week period, sure. right? And it was bad. Um, fortunately, we had, there was still some customers that were actually benefited in a sense from digital transformation. And some of them ended up having their best revenue years ever, mm -hmm. uh, revenue year ever. Uh, but overall, 
net, I mean, there was obviously we, we, a lot of companies in tech took a huge hit. So what was interesting about tech though, is that it bounced back faster. So when a lot of the economy was lagging, it seems like tech was like a rocket ship taking off again mm -hmm. very quickly. I'm sure. curious this time around, do you see tech rebounding quickly from a, for correlating from the perspective of the greater economy? Right. Mm -hmm. do, do you do you think that tech's going to kind of bounce back faster than the greater economy? If there is, you know, if it looks like we're going into you know potentially recession, is tech going to bounce back faster like it did in 2020, or do you feel like it's going to be a slower recovery uh, within tech as well? Well, I, I don't know that I'm in a position to make that prediction, but I can tell mm -hmm. you the two lenses through which we'll be paying attention. Right. Uh, on a macro perspective, you know, technology. Uh, by the mere way it's constructed, offers a level of speed to scale and contract uh, that is very difficult to compete with um, in a, you know, call it hardware-based business or brick-and-mortar-based business. And so from that perspective, you could make the argument that technology as a category, if it's a technology-based business, they have a better shot at rebounding faster. I think it's more important, though, to go uh, sort of block by block and say not all technology companies serve the same customer with the same type of product. Um, and so if you just broke it down one level and said SMBs versus the enterprise, SMBs tend to purchase things faster, right, mm -hmm. than the enterprise larger companies. And so maybe SMB technology companies find it easier to pivot and scale in, in this ecosystem and in, in this environment. Um, but that being said, even the category that they serve, right? The category that they serve or the industry that they serve may never rebound, right? A an area that we think is at risk for cat like just categorically being different forever permanently on a new paradigm is office space. A very serious percentage of employees are now permanently partially remote or fully remote. As a result, the pure amount of occupancy on a fully leased building is going to come down. And so I don't know if you ever rebound from that if you still offer that same type of office space. You'll likely have to find a way to innovate. Jacob, those are all very interesting insights and a lot for me uh, to think through in our audience as well. I'm, uh, I'm really excited to, to listen through this again and just start to, to think through uh, what, what you bring into the table today. So uh, unfortunately, we're up on time. I, I feel like I could continue to talk to you for hours about this stuff. And I always enjoy talking with you. And, and thanks again for, for coming on today. This was a lot of fun. It's my pleasure, James. Thanks for having me and happy uh, to support your guys's vision for bringing this type of knowledge uh, to the masses and your listeners. And it's, it's a delight to be uh, uh, in, in the room watching you guys, you know, uh, really create the magic that you do. Well, it's a special moment in history. You're our first guest, which is, I think, pretty cool. <laughs> I'm so. honored. I'm honored that you <laughs> asked me to do that. Thanks. For and sure, thank for you, sure. Nick, uh, for what you're going to do and helping put together this show. And for everybody tuning in, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. Adios, amigo.